Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Emily Molden. I'm the executive director of the Nantucket Land Council. And this is our final installment of this year's Clean Water Series topics on tap. I want to first thank the Nantucket Land Council Water Fund and our Water Fund Founders Circle for making these programs possible. This evening, we are going to be revisiting a topic that we introduced last summer around the health of Nantucket's island ponds, our freshwater ponds, the monitoring work that we are doing out there, and particularly the surveillance and monitoring that we're doing around harmful algal blooms. I also am very excited that we are joining this evening with our partners at the Nantucket Conservation Foundation to talk more specifically about the palm pond some of the health concerns that have arisen from the water quality there and how we're working together to manage the health of that pond and improve its conditions into the future. So the Nantucket Land Council has been monitoring island ponds for a little over 10 years. We really focus on the smaller ponds as the town of Nantucket does a lot of work on our, our greater ponds. And we began monitoring the Palm Pond back in 2015. So you'll hear a little bit more history about that area specifically. We have two speakers with us this evening, but before I introduce those, I want to just let everybody know that there will be plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. And you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a little Q and A box and you can enter any questions that you have throughout the presentation into that box, and I'll be able to read them out to our presenters at the end of the presentation. Don't feel like you have to wait until the end. You can enter those questions in as they arise throughout the program. So this evening, we're gonna first be hearing from the Nantucket Land Council's ecologist and Nantucket waterkeeper, RJ Turcott, who's gonna talk a bit about the Land Council's water quality monitoring program, as well as tools of the trade and a little bit about the science of harmful algal blooms. Then we're gonna be hearing from Karen Beattie. Karen Beattie is um, the director of the Science and Stewardship Department at the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. Her background is in biological sciences and wildlife management. She's been working for the Conservation Foundation since 1992 has a wealth of information and knowledge on all of our island habitats. So we're very excited to bring them into our dialogue this evening around water quality, harmful algal blooms, and the management of the palm pond. So with that, I would like to turn it over to RJ Turcott. Thank you very much, Emily, and good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I am going to share my screen with you, put this slideshow into presentation mode here, and we will get started. So again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this, uh, this talk is going to talk about, as Emily said, some of the tools of the trade for water quality monitoring, but the data that we're gonna talk about, the HABs and um, how we're dealing with them is going to be specific this evening to Kapom Pond. Um, as well as uh, some of the images that we're going to show. So water quality in general, but also very specifically Kapom Pond this evening. So a primer on HABs, harmful algal blooms. So one of the things that I like to begin with when giving people an introduction to harmful algal blooms is to point out that they things that are producing the toxins we're concerned about are not true algae. So true algae are a really, really, really diverse group of photosynthetic organisms. They're not quite plants, but they're closely related. Some of them are single celled and they go all the way up to these massive, massive, they're called macroalgae structures. If you think of kelp forests and things like that, that are almost 60 feet long, that's also algae, but most of the stuff we're going to be talking about this evening is really, really small. You need to see it with a microscope, and when you can see it with your naked eye, it's because it's a bunch of them clumped together in either a colony or just attached to each other uh, floating along the surface. So there's true algae, and then there's what we're going to specifically be talking about with harmful algal blooms. Those are cyanobacteria. So these are not technically algae, they're bacteria that are able to photosynthesize. So they can produce their own energy using the sun and uh, sunlight. 
and they are the ones that are producing the toxins that we're going to be talking about. Now, as I said, the images tonight are all going to be Nantucket ones, and these were all um, from Kapon Pond. These are all little organisms that are endemic and, and found in Kapon Pond, as well as other ponds on the island. But uh, these ones specifically are from um, the scientists we have to process our live samples of algae. So closer look at these cyanobacteria. As I said, they photosynthesize and cyanobacteria are a really, really, really old group of organisms over 2 billion years before we had a breathable atmosphere on this planet. Cyanobacteria are actually the ones who started doing the work with photosynthesis of bringing enough oxygen into the atmosphere for eukaryotic organisms to start to survive both in the water and on land. So they really made the planet habitable a long time ago and are still with us today. So they're pretty fascinating. They're native here. It's not something that's, we, we deal a lot with invasive species, Phragmites, which you can see in the image around Kapon Pond. We deal with um, invasive fish species, insects, things that we've accidentally brought here. These cyanobacteria are just are here. They're supposed to be here, um, but they're getting to a number that's becoming a problem. Uh, they're almost all single celled, as I said. Some are filamentous or colonial, meaning that they grow together. And when they hit a certain density, we call it a bloom. And they're usually visible at that point to the naked eye, but not always, but most of the time. So they love warming waters. It's part of climate change. One of the issues we're dealing with is we're having a longer growing season for these types of algae and cyanobacteria. They love phosphorus. So when we're talking about algal blooms and salt water, we're talking mostly about nitrogen as the limiting factor and then fresh water, it's phosphorus. And they also prefer higher pH. Um, most of these species can produce toxins, but they don't always. A lot of times you'll find them if you scooped a, a bottle of water and took it home and put it under the microscope, you'd find them. They're not producing toxins and we're not entirely sure why they produce toxins. We don't know why that's useful. We don't know if it's to protect them from predators or each other, if it's a competition thing, we're not sure. This is very new science. So what's a bloom and what makes it harmful? We like to talk about these blooms that we post about on the town website. They look like green spilled paint often, most of the time, especially at Kapam and our freshwater systems. So the top part of the water column in a pond, and this is just an example of pond, is called the photic zone. It's where light reaches, and that's where you're going to find your algae and your cyanobacteria who need to photosynthesize. So as the water warms, it gets stratified, and if conditions are ideal, if there's enough phosphorus and the water is warm enough, these cyanobacteria and these algae will be dividing and the warmer the water gets, the faster they're able to divide and reproduce. And that's how we start to get over a threshold where we're past the healthy amount of algae in the water and we're starting to get into bloom territory. Now, we have all this algae dividing in our pond and then we have some wind. Nantucket has plenty of wind. Kapon Pond's no different. It's right next to pretty much a budding Nantucket Sound and it gets plenty of wind. So wind will stir up the surface and sort of stir the drink, so to speak, where it'll start to move and create waves and that water will really mix everything in the water col uh, column up, especially a shallow pond like a palm that's less than 10 feet deep. So those waves will really get things moving all the way down to the sediment at the bottom and mix things nicely. And as it's being mixed and things are getting tossed around, a nifty feature cyanobacteria have is that they're able to regulate their own buoyancy. And not all of them can do this, but a lot of the ones we're dealing with can. And they're able to really collect along the very surface of the water so they can photosynthesize most effectively. And this really allows them to take off and it gives them an advantage over all the other true algae that are floating in our water column. So, the other thing wind does, other than just mix up the water column and make nutrients from the sediment available in a shallow pond, is if it's coming from one direction consistently, it's going to push the algae to the opposite side of the pond. So if it's coming out of the southwest, um, the algae that's along the surface is going to get pushed and really concentrated in the northeast corner of the pond and so on and so forth. 
And so that's a lot of times why we see a really, really concentrated green slick of, of algae, a harmful algal bloom in one corner of the pond. It's because it's being pressed there by the wind. And if the wind changes direction, it could dissipate, it could disappear. Uh, sometimes blooms will last for days and then other times it'll get blown in for a few hours and then the wind shifts and it gets dispersed again and it seems like it's completely gone. So what is driving our harmful algal blooms? So I mentioned climate change. We have, oh, people are beeping on the street outside. Sorry about that. So I mentioned climate change in regard to harmful algal blooms. We are seeing more and more, especially in the Northeastern United States, heavy precipitation, but really concentrated. So historically, we would on Nantucket get somewhere in the vicinity of 35 to 40 inches of precipitation in a year. And it'll be pretty evenly distributed. Um, both on Nantucket and throughout the Northeast though, we're starting to see as the years go by, more heavy precipitation that's really episodic. So a good example is this morning, it was downpouring for a little bit. And we've had a good amount of rain lately, but we have actually been in a drought here in the southeast part of the state for going on a year and a half. This is a good image for showing you exactly what I'm talking about. The west, obviously, if you guys have been paying attention to the forest fires, has been very dry. They are not having this episodic rain as often, but the northeast is. So we don't get as much evenly distributed precipitation the way we used to. We're really just getting a torrent of rain that provides an inch of rain. And the reason that's a problem is because it doesn't get to saturate the soil anymore. And it just runs off into our water bodies really quickly. And it'll take whatever nutrients are on the surface with it into that water body. Um, if we were getting more light rain, but spread out over time, we would get a lot more saturation of the soil, the water would be able to be absorbed into the soil. It wouldn't just go flash flood down in and cause problems with nutrients. The soil would be able to filter it a little bit. We hopefully wouldn't get as much input. And the last thing I wanted to point out as far as climate change, so we're getting a lot more heavy rain events that are really episodic. And the other thing we're getting is rising temperatures. So um, it used to be referred to as global warming. We've moved away from that for a lot of reasons, but the climate is getting warmer. And the Northeast is one of the fastest warming segments of the country. Same way we're getting a lot more episodic heavy rain events. So the temperature and the way we're getting our precipitation are really contributing to these harmful algal blooms and the things we're dealing with on these ponds. So this slide is going to talk about another factor around our ponds and that is development. So on the left there is an image of sitting on the pond and looking towards shore, really good vegetative buffer, really good natural conditions. You can see trees, you can see aquatic vegetation. Um, you don't see any man-made structures. And so if you look at the bottom of that left image, we have a blue arrow for runoff volume. We have a green arrow for phosphorus inputs and we have a brown arrow for sediment inputs. So this is ideal. You have a really good buffer where humanity is separated from our pond. And in the middle image, we have a house that has a decent vegetative buffer in front of it, but, and we'll use the arrows to illustrate this, things start to increase, especially sediment inputs. The closer you have a structure that's man-made to the water and the less of a vegetative and natural buffer there is next to the pond, the more of an impact we're gonna have. And then the final image is a, a house that's directly on the pond with really no vegetative buffer anymore. And as you can see, everything, the runoff volume, as well as the nutrients, in this case, phosphorus and the sediment input really increase significantly from when we have a good buffer, 18 times having a good buffer, five times as much runoff volume and six times the phosphorus input. Now, partially the nutrient input is because that house is probably fertilizing that green lawn, but in general, if there isn't a buffer between our activities and the water, you're going to see water quality degrade. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the background of how harmful algal blooms occur and what triggers, triggers them and what's, what's fueling them. Now we're going to talk about the toxins they produce. So cyanobacteria produce cyanotoxins and they produce three main kinds. They produce dermatotoxins, and those are ones that affect your skin. They can give you a rash. They're usually 
um, a rash that occurs within a few hours of contact. So if you come in contact with a harmful algal bloom that's producing dermatotoxins, within a few hours, you'll probably develop some sort of rash. Uh, the next one is hepatotoxins, and these ones affect your liver. Um, that image on the right, that molecular structure, that's microcystin. That's a very, very common one. Uh, we see it frequently in harmful algal blooms on Nantucket, um, and it does damage to your liver, which can be both acute. It can be if there's enough of a concentration, um, you can be affected immediately, but low doses can also have a longer term effect in terms of weeks or even months before you um, are really affected by those hepatotoxins. Uh, the last one is neurotoxins. So these ones are ones that attack your nervous system. Um, there's one specifically that we've encountered called anatoxin A, and that one can affect your voluntary muscles as well as your involuntary muscles. Uh, especially the muscles controlling your diaphragm uh, can cause muscles, muscle spasms um, and a lot of different problems. It's very acute. It happens pretty quickly, but luckily uh, the neurotoxins are a little rarer than the other ones. So when talking about toxins, um, oral LD50, this is how much it would take per kilogram of body weight. Um, saxitoxin, anatoxin, microcystin, those ones are ones that we've seen around here. Nodularia is another one, but we don't get that as much around the Northeast. It's a different species of cyanobacteria. But in general, as a comparison, one of the most toxic things we know of is ricin, um, cobra venom, cyanide. Um, these toxins, these algae are producing are right in that range. They're very toxic. Um, just to give you a little bit of an idea and a little bit of scale on what we're dealing with when we do have a harmful algal bloom. So we have these harmful algal blooms from time to time. What are we doing about them? We, as Emily said in the introduction, have been at the Land Council doing small pond water quality monitoring for just over 10 years. And we've collected data on a bunch of ponds, Kapom, Gibbs, Little Wee Weeder, Maxi, Long Pond, the head specifically, Pest House, Tom Nevers, Washing My Comet, Hummock, Clark's Cove, or West Hummock, Hansu Spring, and even a salt marsh at this point. Um, this data, we try to, we don't have it all up yet, but we have most of that data publicly available on our website if you're ever interested in looking at any of the ponds reports and looking at what water quality looks like in any of the bodies of water we've historically done. Um, we're trying to make that all available. And if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to us about it. So how do we monitor water quality? Uh, the Land Council monitors a bunch of different parameters to try to paint a picture of what's going on in a pond based on the water quality. So we have physical, chemical, and biological characteristics. So the physical ones, uh, example, are transparency and temperature, chemical, we have conductance, dissolved solids, pH, and dissolved oxygen. And we also do nitrogen and phosphorus. We end up shipping a sample off island to a laboratory to test for those nutrients. And then biological, we analyze the algae. So we'll take a grab sample uh, from the surface typically, and sometimes at depth, and we have it shipped off island uh, to a scientist who specifically puts it on the microscope and comes up with those images I showed you earlier. So we can tell how much algae is in the water column, and we can also tell what is in the water column, who is there. Okay, so some of the tools we use to measure this stuff. This is one of the oldest ones in use today. This is a Secchi disc. This is one of the devices for water quality that hasn't really gotten more high tech over the years. And that's specifically because when it was originally designed, um, the idea was it could be something anyone could produce and be affordable so that people could get out there and sort of measure water quality without having to spend a fortune or have some sort of technical degree. So all a Secchi disc is, is a black and white disc. It's separated into four quadrants and two of them are black and the opposite ones are white. And you lower it down into the water column and it gives you an idea of the clarity of the water. So that's a really easy measurement that we can get um, and sort of figure out A, how much water or how much algae is in the water column at the time, but also how much sediment is in the water column, because that can really affect how the light penetrates as well. Uh, this is a YSI meter. This is a handheld device with a probe attached to it. The probe has a cable running down it and we measure every foot. Um, 
The probe gets lowered into the water. We can measure dissolved oxygen with it, as you can see on the screen, as well as temperature. And this one is really, really handy because you used to bring a small chemistry kit with you to test dissolved oxygen specifically. And nowadays you can have it pretty much instantaneously with a device like this. And we can measure from the surface of the water all the way to the very bottom and figure out what the oxygen looks like, which is really important. Next one, this is called an ultrameter. This is actually an older unit, um, but still an amazing, amazing device. It's, we use it for conductivity, total dissolved solids and pH, um, which are critical factors when you're looking at water quality in a pond. And how do we collect water samples? So these are much like the Secchi disc, some more old school devices. Um, the one pictured top right is an integrate hose and jug. And basically what happens is you can see on the hose, one end is weighted. Uh, those are metal weights. Those are actually big giant um, hex nuts and a string attached and the hose has depth measured on it in meters or feet. And you lower that hose carefully down into the water and hoist it back out. And if you're careful and have the other end in the jug, you can carefully pour off a sample of water into there. And if you wanted to get a representation of the algal community and the nitrogen and phosphorus from zero to four feet, you can do it cheaply and effectively with this. Um, I can tell you from experience that it is really, really hard to do in a kayak. And there's a lot of wrestling matches I have lost with an integrate hose in the kayak, especially on a Kapan pond. Um, but it's really effective and a cheap way to do it. The one below it is one of my favorites as well. Um, this is a Van Dorn bottle, and all it is is a PVC tube with two caps. They have bungee cords attached to them, and they're spring-loaded. So you lower it down to a certain depth in the water, and we like to collect the bottom part of the water column with this. So we lower it down just above the bottom of the pond, and then you send that messenger down, that metal thing you see on the line there, and it hits a button on top of the bottle and snaps it shut. And that sample of water that you have from the bottom is sealed. It's not going to be contaminated with any other water from anywhere else. And you can pour that into a bottle and have it analyzed. And you know that that water is specifically chemistry from, say, six feet, the bottom of Kapan Pond. You're not getting any interference from anywhere else in the water column. So there are a couple of devices we use to collect the water that are really, really awesome. So what happens if and when we see a harmful algal bloom on Kapan Pond? or any pond for that matter that we're monitoring. First of all, if you guys have been out to many of the ponds on Nantucket, you might've seen these signs. This is a collaborative effort uh, between the town, NCF, ourselves at the Land Council, the Land Bank, uh, and Audubon as well. And we're really working to get these ponds marked with these signs. This is the red one for bloom detected and to stay away, but there's also a yellow one saying that blooms have been here in the past and to keep an eye out and here's what to look for. And as soon as we see <laughs> there's a bloom, we A, grab um, a grab sample for testing ourselves, but we put up these red signs to tell people to stay away. We uh, post on the town webpage and we go through social our own social media channels to try to tell as many people as possible that uh, there's a harmful algal bloom at this pond and to, to steer clear until it is cleared. With that in mind, if we do have to take a grab sample and there is green water, um, we've alerted everyone as best we can. And then when we get back to the office, we conduct what's called an Abraxas test. This is a chemical strip test, not unlike some of the strip tests you can get for your pool, for testing chemistry in your pool. Um, and basically, we take a small sample, three milliliters, and we put it in a little vial, we freeze and thaw it three times, and this creates, this causes the cyanobacteria cells to lice open, to break open, and they'll release their toxins. And then we have a reagent we add to it, we shake it up, we let it sit for a few minutes, and then we put a test strip in there. And as you can see in that image on the top there, this test is specifically for anatoxin A. You have your control line. The control line has to appear. If it doesn't appear, the test isn't valid. And then you have your test line, and the test line's coloration is um, an eyeball test for how much toxins found in the water in parts per billion. So the strip that is pictured there is positive for anatoxin A. 
And if there was a really dark purple test line, then chances are there is no toxin present. So we test for anatoxin A as well as microcystin. And if it comes back positive, then we ship them off to the professionals. So we ship off this grab sample on ice overnight down to a place called Greenwater Labs in Florida. They're experts, they get samples sent to them from all over the country. And those samples are tested for A, the potentially toxigenic species in the water. So they'll put the sample under a microscope, they'll look and see what species are there that can produce toxins. And then they'll do a formal toxin analysis and tell us the toxin levels at that time. So this typically takes a few days during the summer when things are busy. So it'll be a couple of days delayed in finding out what's in the water and if it's producing toxins. And in that time, we really try to keep people away from the ponds. Uh, if it comes back positive and we have toxins in the water, we keep people away until the, the bloom looks like it's been visually dissipated and the water looks clear again. And then we'll grab another grab sample and send that back to green water. And when that comes back negative, then we tell everyone it's okay to go back and we take down those red signs and replace them with the yellow signs of an abundance of caution. So that's our basic water quality monitoring program and have monitor monitoring program. We are, all, we are also working with the Conservation Foundation and doing some other cool stuff. Um, so right here, that is a aerosol sampling device. So this is a really nifty little machine um, some off-island researchers got together with us and built. Um, that green box is a waterproof, it's actually an ammo can, if you can believe it, from like an Army-Navy store with a gasket and a little lock on it. And inside is a little electric motor and a vacuum pump. And it is pulling air through that hose over a little glass fiber filter inside that funnel, which is mounted to a tripod. So it pulls about six liters per minute of air over that filter. And during storm events where we get that wind creating waves and stirring things around, like we talked about earlier, it's been found that some toxins can get airborne. And with this device, this is actually the morning that we captured anatoxin A getting free from the pond for the very first time. This was at Kapan Pond in September of 2019. Um, there was a lot of anatoxin A in the water at the time, a really high amount, high concentration. And we managed to capture trace amounts. So it wasn't high in the air, but it had gotten airborne during a thunderstorm that was blowing through. Um, and it landed on the filter and that was a scientific first. So no one had ever captured it airborne before. Um, we were able to get that published in Lake and Reservoir Management. Um, and it's just a really fascinating um, occurrence. We didn't even know that was possible. So that was some history that was made on Kabam Bond. And then the other thing, we've been working on is we've been partnering with the same off-island researchers on this really awesome monitoring buoy. This is a really high-tech piece of equipment. Um, it's solar powered and it's able to sit out there and take almost live samples of uh, phycocyanin and chlorophyll, which are indicators of algae and specifically cyanobacteria, as well as temperature, pH, um, all sorts of things and combine that with uh, the local weather forecast. And it is connected to um, similar to a cell phone to the local cell tower. And we can get every 10 minutes an update and data. So they were testing that out last year for the first time. Um, it's really great because we don't even have to be at the pond to sort of be able to tell if there's a bloom imminent. Um, so it's an expensive piece of technology, but it's been uh, really cool to work with. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Karen Beatty of the Conservation Foundation, and she's going to talk about how they are working on um, preventing halves at Kabam Pond going forward. Thank you, RJ. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here and to take part in this presentation. And before I want to get started, I just want to say like how awesome it is to have a partner like the Land Council that's been doing all of this great research and monitoring work over the last 10 years. Um, this has been invaluable information for us as we decide what we can actually do to make some changes to the pond to improve the situation in terms of actual management options. 
So that's pretty much um, the Conservation Foundation's involvement in this project is taking all of that great information that RJ just described to you um, and trying to turn it into management options. Um, and in order to do that, we've been working with SWCA Environmental Consultants. They are um, a nationwide consulting firm that has 36 branches across the United States, two of which are in Massachusetts. Uh, we started working with them about five years ago. We have another much smaller pond um, in Shimo called Pest House Pond. It's less than an acre in size. And that's where the Conservation Foundation um, just started to kind of dip our toe into the arena of pond management working with SWCA. Um, it's a small pond, but some of this, the management issues were very similar to what RJ just described at Kapam. So we've been working with SWCA and it's been a great partnership. And so we're continuing that relationship. Um, I'll also add that SWCA um, is no stranger to Nantucket. They're also working on a bunch of projects with the, Nan the Nantucket Land Bank. Um, so over the next couple of slides, I'd like to describe to you like what we're doing in terms of actual management and why we're doing it and what we see some of the next steps um, are. If you could advance um, RJ, that'd be great. Um, so those, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Conservation Foundation, we're a Nantucket-based organization, a private nonprofit land trust, and we own 9,010 acres of conservation land on the island. So that's a third of the island. So as you can see, there's a lot of different management things that we need to be thinking about as the island's largest landowner. Um, but included in that 9,010 acres is 13.6 acres that almost completely surround Kapam Pond. And this property was donated to us by the Verney family back in the 1970s. And if you think back to that slide that um, RJ showed previously where he was talking about um, the difference um, between ponds that have a vegetated buffer around them and then ponds that have development right up against the border, um, you can see that this undeveloped conservation land that surrounds Kapan Pond um, is providing a really important buffer between the development and the pond itself. Um, in fact, I actually kind of noted the phrase RJ used previously, keeping humanity separated from the pond. So um, the conservation land we own is, is, um, is actually doing that, which is a good thing. If you could advance RJ, that'd be great. Um, so working with SWCA, we contracted with them in 2020 to do an assessment of Kapan Pond. They had never worked on Kapan Pond before. And they came and they did a site visit and they um, did collected a bunch of data, including um, documenting the vegetation that's around the pond, the aquatic vegetation that's in the pond. They did a detailed bathymetry analysis, which allows you to um, estimate the volume of water in the pond. Um, sediment depth, they collected some sediment samples to get an idea of how much um, nutrients were stored in the sediment. They did a drone flight um, and some basic water chemistry. So that information, um, they took that information and then they also um, considered all of the great data that the Land Council has been collecting at Kapan Pond for 10 years and kind of distilled all of that into this technical memorandum that we received um, in January of this year, which is basically um, a summary of the management options that we have available to us to reduce harmful algae blooms and improve water quality and overall pond health. Um, I will mention that another component of that assessment and management plan that I'm not gonna discuss because it's just not the topic of um, tonight's presentation is um, assessment of how to, how to manage the Phragmites populations that are surrounding the pond, the non-native invasive species surrounding the pond. So that's a, 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 part, a part of what we're doing. Um, and you may have, if you're paying attention to the news on Nantucket this week, you'll see that there's a lot of Phragmites management going on right now. Um, I'm just, I'm not gonna get into that tonight, but I'd be happy to take any questions about it um, in the, in the Q&A. Um, if you could advance please, RJ. Um, so the foundation and the land council considered a number of options that were presented in the report that SWCA prepared. Um, nutrient management basically involves removing the food source of the algae before the algae starts to form. And I'll discuss in more detail exactly how that's done. Um, algicide application, algicide is, is, is an aquatic herbicide that specifically targets algae, and that can be used as a tool to directly manage the algae itself. 
And these first two options are pretty commonly employed management techniques that are used in a lot of ponds that are having problems, um, such as Kaplan Pond is. Some other things we considered, um, aeration. If you think of um, ponds that you see in golf courses or in parks, um, artificially created ponds very often have fountains in them. So the, the purpose of this is very similar to what, um, if you have a fish tank and you, you put that bubbler in the fish tank and it introduces oxygen into the water and that can promote beneficial bacteria and increase the decomposition process. So it is a potential tool that could be used. It's not frequently used in natural ponds such as Kapam. So it's a potential option, but it's not one that we're pursuing right now because Kapam is a large pond. You'd have to have a whole bunch of aerators um, it would create kind of an unnatural um, managed system. And it, of course it would be very costly and you'd have to have like the power to run the motors. So at this point, we're not looking at that, but it is another tool in the toolbox. Similarly, dredging, um, this is actually a pretty commonly employed technique and it um, is very often used, especially in ponds that are extremely highly degraded. And it involves completely just trying to remove all of the acutement accumulated sediments in the bottom of the pond where the nutrients are stored. So you just try to get it out of the system, take it somewhere else and sort of reset the ecological clock. Um, that too could potentially be an option for Kapam in the future, but it is also not something that we're currently thinking about. Um, dredging can be extremely effective, but it would be very expensive to do in a pond of this size. Um, there's access issues at Kapan Pond for getting the equipment into the pond. And then the thing you really have to think about is what are you going to do with all that sediment once you remove it? Um, and sometimes that sediment can be contaminated because of um, many, many years of past land use um, occurring around the pond, things that have happened that we don't even know about. So um, dredging isn't something we're looking at right now. Aeration isn't something we're looking at. Um, but if you could hit the button, RJ. The two things we're focusing on this year and for the, the, um, the coming years, or at least the short-term future, are implementing nutrient management during the spring before the algae start to form, and then algicide application um, when a harmful algae bloom is detected. And I'll talk a little, in a little bit more detail about those two management options in the next couple slides. So this is just a really, really simplistic um, figure that shows how nutrient management works. Um, as RJ has mentioned, um, high levels of phosphorus are present in Kapan Pond, and it is one of the things that is fueling harmful algae blooms. It's not the only thing, as, as he said. Um, there's increasing temperature, more dramatic weather, um, lots of different things, but increased phosphorus is definitely an issue. So alum or aluminum phosphate is a granular chemical that binds with phosphorus and other impurities that are in the water column. And it forms this solid precipitate that's called a flocculant, which I think is a great word. Um, flocculant settles out of the water column and then it can be deposited at the bottom of the pond. And what that does is it basically removes the phosphorus um, from the system so that it's not available um, anymore to fuel um, algae blooms. Next, please. So at Kapam Pond, um, we received our report back in January of this year and considered the two options we wanted to pursue. And then we applied to the Nantucket Conservation Commission for permitting. And I just really wanted to highlight that because all in pond management in Massachusetts requires permitting from the Conservation Commission we have thankfully have a very um, strict um, Wetlands Protection Act that requires permitting. So everything I'm talking about is something that we actually have a permit for. Um, we were able to get that permitting and we did an alum treatment in the pond in May of 2021. And if you look closely at the slide, it's pretty far away, but what's inside that orange box is actually a little tiny John boat that is broadcasting the alum over the surface of the pond. And that's actually the way you apply it. Um, they go back and forth and back and forth to cover the pond surface um, uniformly, broadcasting the alum into the water. And then the motor that's on the, on the boat actually assists in, in incorporating the alum into the water column. 
So the way that you calculate how much alum you would put into a pond is you, um, you use the pond water volume, so how much water is in the pond, and then you use an estimate of how much excess phosphorus loading is in the pond. And this year, um, because as far as I know, the, this is the first large pond on Nantucket that has ever been treated with alum. So this is kind of a first for management on Nantucket. You know, we went pretty conservative. We estimated the amount of alum we wanted to use based only on the phosphorus loading that was in the water itself. We did not consider what's in the sediment because we just wanted to see how this worked and um, kind of proceed with caution. So, um, so that was a first on Nantucket this year, um, getting an alum treatment in a large pond. Can you please um, advance, RJ? So RJ and the Land Council um, monitored the pond over this past summer and um, weekly, on a weekly basis. And at the beginning of August, which is what has been happening for the last five or so years in Kapan Pond, um, RJ detected um, the first sign of a harmful algae bloom forming. Um, there was algae in the pond for most of the summer, but this was um, the first sign of a harmful algae bloom based on all the techniques he described in his presentation. So as soon as he saw that, he, he notified us, the Conservation Foundation, we notified SWCA, and we had preemptively um, ordered the algicide so that we had it here on the island. Um, and within the first couple of days, they were able to come over and do an algicide treatment. And what happened was that um, although there is still algae in the pond, so the pond, when you look at it, it still looks green. There's definitely still algae there. Um, there's still a lot of excess phosphorus in the pond for sure, but we have not, um, as of yet, seen another harmful algae bloom starting to form in Kapan Pond this year. And that is, um, is pretty different from the last five years, as, Al, as um, RJ was talking about before when he showed you the picture of the air, aerating detector. Um, that was picking up toxins in September. So in past years, the pond has started to bloom at the beginning of August and has pretty much hosted a harmful algae bloom for most of the rest of the summer, August, September, sometimes even later than that. So we are, um, the good news is that we are extremely cautiously optimistic that we are making tiny baby steps in the right direction. Um, and then, then this is just like a first year of management, but at least we were able to prevent um, two months or one and a half months of continuous harmful algae blooms as yet. We're certainly not out of the woods. The pond isn't um, pristine, but we're, we're making steps in the right direction. Um, and we're gonna continue this work going forward. Um, can you just advance please, RJ? So in terms of next steps, um, unless we detect another harmful, uh, another harmful algae bloom this year, um, we will likely not um, apply any more algicide, but going forward, at least for the next couple of years, um, we will continue with the alum and the algicide treatments when they're needed. Uh, and monitor the response, which of course is always really important, um, both visual monitoring and water chemistry, so that we can fine tune our application rates and kind of learn, um, learn as we go along. We're considering doing additional assessment work to pinpoint the nutrient sources a little bit better um, so that we can target our management actions. So, you know, exactly how much of this is in the sediment versus the water column how much of it is coming into the pond from groundwater versus surface water? What is the contribution of um, septic and fertilizer being used in the surrounding watershed? Um, getting more information on that will help us to um, target our management work going forward. And then I think the most important key is just continuing collaboration, um, our collaboration with the Land Council, but also the other groups on the island, conservation groups, the town of Nantucket, there's a lot of pond management work that's going on here now. Um, and we all need to be working together and collaborating and learning um, from these different practices as we try them on, um, try them. Um, for example, I know that um, for my Comet Pond, the Nantucket Pond Coalition is considering potentially doing a dredging project. So if that happens in my Comet, then we are all gonna learn our lessons about how that works and um, you know, if it's effective and things like that. So um, 
the Conservation Foundation looks forward to continuing our efforts well into the future with our partners. Um, I think that's that's all I have. Great, right. thank you. Go ahead, Emily. Thank you, thank you so much, RJ and Karen, for that presentation and for all the information. I think we're gonna jump right into the Q and A here with the rest of our time, as we've already had a few questions coming in. So the first question that I wanted to uh, put out there was, and I think RJ, maybe this is more directed towards you, whether the samples that are being collected during all of the monitoring work that you spoke about, could they be analyzed on island if we had a water lab? How would that impact and influence the work that the land council is doing in the ponds? It would have an immediate and I really think awesome impact because a lot of the water quality monitoring comes down to being able to get these samples shipped to a lab. Um, it is expensive for a nonprofit like NCF or like ourselves at NLC to get these sample anal samples analyzed professionally, period. I mean, when they get to the lab, a professional has to analyze them. It's very technical work. And then when you add that onto that, the fact that we have to get them on ice and ship them overnight, um, oftentimes all the way to Florida, or New York, um, it is thousands of dollars that we could be saving by being able to analyze here. And that's not just for us. I mean, the town processes a lot, a lot of samples and not just algae, all sorts of things. So it would be enormous to be able to have a lab on site. Great, thanks, RJ. Um, here's another one that I think might also be for you, RJ. The question is, do we have a way to monitor and do we know how toxic blooms could be affecting wildlife like wading birds or even fish in a pond or other animals? Yes, so first part of that, um, it does affect wildlife in um, same way or at least a similar way to how it affects humans. So three toxins we were talking about, we had Dermatoxins, which will affect skin of birds, fish, amphibians, reptiles. Hepatotoxins still affect the liver in a similar way. And neurotoxins still affect the central nervous system. Um, and that lab I was referring to where we send our samples for toxin analysis, Greenwater actually does uh, offer that service. They offer uh, analysis of either entire organisms or if you know the toxin, which we often do, you can send the organ that's affected by. So for example, microcystin, um, we could send the liver. If we found a dead seagull or a dead goose, uh, we could absolutely send the liver. Um, but I personally am a water quality monitor and specialist, and I do not know how to dissect a goose. So it would be something where we would probably partner with offshore or someone qualified to um, dissect it for us. And then that's something else we would ship just like the water sample, but it can be done and um, you can find out how it's affecting wildlife. Great. Okay. And here's another question that came in, uh, maybe more directed to you, Karen. Uh, there's a question about what algicide was used, if that's information that you have handy and whether the algicide could have impacts to other organisms. Um, the name of the algaecide is Captain XT, and it is a um, copper-based algaecide. Um, and I will say, as far as anything like this, algaecide, herbicide, um, any kind of chemical that you're adding to a natural system like this, um, you definitely have to weigh the pros and the cons of what you're doing, and you definitely have to be absolutely following the exact um, recommendations for the application rates and all of that. And that's something that we take very seriously. As I mentioned, our first alum treatment was a very, we used a very conservative estimate of the amount of alum to just see what the, the effect was. Um, all of these in-pond management techniques have been extremely um, scrutinized by federal and um, also state 
uh, regulators. I know that there are some things that are available that to, in other states that Massachusetts um, are, not, are not considered safe. So that's where all that permitting comes in, um, going through the Wetlands Protection Act and um, under the scrutiny of the, um, of the Conservation Commission and the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. So, um, you know, they're relatively safe as long as they are used as they are supposed to be used. If they are not used responsibly, they can be a lot of side effects. Um, and we are, that's why we're working with consultants that do this kind of work all the time and are, are very good at, um, at, you know, recommending what to use. But, you know, just going back to the costs versus the benefits, um, you know, thinking about all of the health side effects, the public health side effects that can potentially occur from a harmful algae bloom. Those are some pretty scary numbers that RJ was showing in terms of the toxicity levels. So that's something you have to consider um, and weigh that against, you know, should we or should we not be um, using algae side? And that, that those are all things we think about. We don't just like throw chemicals in the pond and walk away. It's a very serious decision that we take seriously. Great, thank you, Karen. And I just wanna take a moment in case there were any uh, participants that joined us late, if you do have a question, feel free to type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen so we can pick it up. Um, you kind of touched on this already, uh, a question a little bit different, more specifically asking what are the risks and potential downsides of treating with uh, substances like alum and algicides. And I think, as you said, obviously not following um, appropriate treatment mm -hmm. or quantities or application methods uh, would be one thing to be concerned about. But are there any other risks or potential downsides of using these kinds of treatments? If you want to comment, Karen, and then we'll see if RJ has anything to add. Um, like, again, using them inappropriately. So the, um, the algicide that we use um, can have detrimental impacts on dissolved oxygen quantities in the water. So the recommended way to go about using it is to um, put half the amount in the pond, wait a week, and then put the other half of the application on to kind of mitigate for that. Um, some of the other potential, I mean, you know, a copper-based aldicide, if you were going to use that year after year after year at very high levels, you could wind up with um, high levels of copper in the water column. Similarly with alum, it's, you know, it's aluminum sulfate. And if you use it year after year after year at very high levels, um, you may wind up with high levels of alum in the substrate. So um, these are all things, you know, that need to be considered and monitored over time. Um, you know, we don't wanna be doing alum treatments every single year from now until in perpetuity but hopefully these techniques are gonna help us at least get a handle on it so that we can get into more of a management um, phase instead of a mitigation phase, if that makes sense. RJ, did you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, just to sort of support what Karen was saying, um, as far as the alum goes, if you're not careful and you do use too much, it can suppress oxygen in the water and cause harm to fish and things that have gills. Um, so you do have to be really careful with the dosage. And the other thing is, is with the algicide, um, it kills the things other than cyanobacteria. So sometimes it kills other species of algae that aren't producing toxins. So you just have to use it sparingly. You really um, should use as little as possible when you're trying to manage these, which is why Karen and I have been going back and forth all summer. I'm out on Kapam at least once a week, every week. And that first bloom that started at the beginning of August, um, we had talked a lot about whether we wanted to um, treat with algicide at other times of the year. And we landed on just if a bloom appears, then we will address it with algicide. And otherwise, we're really going to stay away from using any more than we have to. And I think we've used mm -hmm. the bare minimum. Great. Thanks a lot for that. And I think it also goes back to one of the things that Karen discussed in the presentation around next steps. These are definitely really important management tools for us to um, work on and trying to get the amounts, the quantities right, the doses right, 
for the scenario that we have here at the Palm Pond so they can be used as tools when necessary to try to abate some of these health concerns, but continuing to move forward and look at the pond from a larger scale and a bigger picture and ways that we can make longer term um, headway towards improving its health is certainly something that we're all still working on. Um, another quick question about the alum treatment, and um, there's a, another comment here echoing Karen, your sentiment that flocculent is a great word indeed. And the question is whether the flocculent that's produced gets removed or if it stays on the bottom of the pond. A little bit of a technical chemistry question. I don't know if you'd want to address that or. Um, I'll make a stab at it, but I, and I would defer to our consultants and I can certainly ask more details on this. Pond management and pond chemistry are not my um, very strong area of expertise, which is why we hire consultants that know way more about this than we do. But um, I, believe it, I believe it does stay down there. Um, it probably breaks down over time, but as I mentioned earlier, if you use it too frequently or too much, you can't, there is a risk that the, there will be excess alum, aluminum in the system. So that's why we're being really careful about that. Great, thanks Karen. And I know, I mean, my limited understanding as well of uh, alum treatments is that that flocculin is the aluminum sulfate preferentially binding with that phosphorus. And so like you said, it does stay down there but the reason that it's not a permanent solution is that's obviously not the end of the phosphorus. There's more that's either entering the system through the sediments and or the surrounding watershed. And that's why eventually we'll end up with another bloom even after we've bound up some of that phosphorus. Mm -hmm. um, another final question I think for us, uh, contemplating some cities and other places like Freiburg, Germany that have limited or Pro prohibited fertilizers even, is this approach one that might be useful to consider here in this scenario? RJ, or do you wanna chat about that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, as Karen sort of pointed out earlier and I had a slide specifically showing, luckily we don't have a ton of development right on top of Kapampan, which is really great, but clearly there is phosphorus coming from somewhere that's feeding these cyanobacteria and driving these blooms. Um, so we do have some best management practices in place here on Nantucket for fertilizer use and testing your soil and only using as much as is necessary um, in a watershed like this. And so um, we, NCF and Land Council as well, have been working to try to educate folks on what fertilizer to use, when to use it, how much to use, uh, to really limit it, make sure that the plants that you're growing in your lawn are the ones that are consuming your fertilizer and that it isn't getting downstream and going downhill into ponds like this. Um, but we're going to be looking more closely at where this phosphorus is coming from in the coming years and try to pinpoint where it's coming from. And if it is indeed fertilizers, we'll be, we'll be able to address that. But um, it's a little early to tell if it's coming from fertilizers right now. All right, thank you, RJ, and uh, thank you, Karen. I'm really pleased to have been able to host this conversation and discussion this evening. I know it's uh, really satisfying from the Land Council's perspective to have been monitoring this pond for so many years and to be able to work with the Conservation Foundation as partners, as the pond landowners, to be able to move forward with some kind of management to address the water quality issues. It's really a great partnership and relationship, and we also look forward to continuing it and hope that we can uh, move forward in a similar way on other ponds around Nantucket. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight and this summer for our Clean Water Series. Thanks again to our Water Fund and Water Fund Founders Circle. Um, and I hope you all have a great rest of September. <laughs>